The Roman Republic by Mr. Amster. Before you begin, please make sure that you have a sharpened pencil or pen and a highlighter. As you are noticing, you are seeing an emblem of the Roman flag with the symbol SPQR, which translates to Senatus Populus Romanus. I apologize for my poor Latin, but it translates into the Senate and the people of Rome. And this was a symbol that was a huge part of the identity of Rome. It was all, it was all the people together. And it was a symbol for both the Republic and the Empire. But the first question on your mind is, a Republic, what is that? A Republic versus a democracy. A democracy is a government in which all of the citizens share in the running of the government. A republic is a government in which the leader is not a monarch, but a person elected by citizens. Confused? That's okay. You're forgiven. But the real question is, is the United States a democracy or a republic? The answer is both. In a democracy, the people have a sh their share in running the government. We elect the officials. We choose them. In a republic, though, the citizens choose their leader, or at least in one way or another. The people don't necessarily have a say, but people elect people to run their government for them. Sound similar? A little bit, but let's help you understand the difference. In the United States, we elect senators and we choose the president. Those are examples of the democracy in that we run the government, we choose the senators to make decisions for us, and a republic in which we choose the leader. In Greece, we did not do, they did not do this. They only elected people to run their government. They did not choose a leader. The leader was the democracy. Please take a moment after you have written this in and highlight democracy, republic, and I want you to circle with your highlighter your sentence that both, uh, it is both a democracy and a republic. The government under the republic. In Rome, Rome elects two consuls, one to lead the army and one to direct the government. The Senate, chosen from the Roman upper class, the patricians, at least early on, makes foreign and domestic policy. Later on, they will allow the plebeians, please make a note of that, plebes mean many, by the way, to help in the running of the Senate. Democratic assemblies elected tribunes, from, uh, these were only plebeians, and helped make laws for the common people. One of the new things is a concept known as separation of power. The Republic did not want a king, and they also didn't want, though, one group to have too much power. To do this, they created a separation of power also known as a check and balance. And they wanted to prevent it from having too much power. And I'll show you an example of that a little bit later on. Dictators are leaders appointed briefly in a time of crisis. But maybe I can't say it as well as Harvey Dent. Exactly. In a time of crisis, they would elect one leader because you don't want people arguing. You want decisions, decisive decisions on what to do. Which raises the question, who was Cincinnatus?
Well, he was a Roman dictator. In about 460 BCE, a powerful enemy had surrounded a Roman army. Officials decided that the crisis called for a dictator and that Cincinnatus was the man for the job. The officials found Cincinnatus plowing his fields. But as a loyal and devoted citizen, Cincinnatus left his farm and gathered a, an army. He defeated the enemy in short order and returned to Rome in triumph. Although he probably could have considered ruling, Cincinnatus did not want power. Having done his duty, he returned to his farm a mere 15 or 16 days, depending on what you read, after becoming dictator. However, this game plan doesn't work. And as, and as we were warned in the movie, or in the recording, eventually a guy by the name of Caesar is given that power and doesn't give it up, and thus becomes born the Roman Empire. Please take a moment and highlight two consuls, Senate, separation of power, and dictators, and Cincinnatus, and who he was. Now, what allows the Romans to have power and responsibility for everyone are things known as the Twelve Tables. They are a system of government, well, they are a set of laws that basically gave power to more people. In 451, officials carved 12 laws onto 12 tablets. And what this did is it gave power and it also gave the basis of Roman law. The law confirms the rights of all free citizens to the protection of the law. Citizenship is limited though, unfortunately ladies, to male landowners. And it was hung in the form. And here's an example of what it looks like. Take a moment to write this down, and of course, with any video, if you're going, if I'm going a little too fast, please always feel free to pause the video. Please highlight though, 451, Roman laws, free citizens. You don't actually have to highlight that. Citizenship, limited adult male landowners. As I mentioned earlier, separation of power is known as a concept of checks and balances. And although I don't want you, you don't need to write this down, if you want to take some notes to help you, it wouldn't hurt. Here's an example of the United States. The United States has three government bodies, the executive or the president, the legislative, also known as the Congress, and the judicial or the courts. Now, most of you assume that the president is the most powerful person in the government. No doubt. He's the, face of our, he's the face of our government and often the one you see making decisions. But he does not have unlimited power. For instance, he has a very interesting relationship with the judicial part, or the courts, and let's look at that one. He can give an order. He can declare a law, or create a law. But the courts can declare it unconstitutional. Ah, but if they make a judgment, say somebody that was in, you know, was put in prison for a crime they didn't commit and there's no way to prove otherwise, or he just wants to pardon a buddy, he can appoint, he can give them a pardon. He can also appoint the judges. So he's the one who gives them their power. On the same side, while he only lives, uh, survives in office for four to eight years, the judges serve for life. On the other side, let's take a look at the Roman side.
here we have the two consuls, the 300 senators, please make a note of the 300 senators, the 10 tribunes chosen by the plebeians, and the citizen assemblies, basically where people went and be, were able to pick these people. Now, one thing that is interesting is the notion of civic duty. It is your responsibility as a citizen in your community, in all citizens, in all communities around the world, even today. You may have to do a job, both social or political, by being a citizen there. What's a civic duty that your parents have? If you answered voting, you're correct. In Greece, it meant you got to serve as a senator. In Rome, one of the ones you could do was be in the Roman army, at least early on. Now, the Romans discovered a problem. They realized that having a, a few leaders rule their whole army was inefficient. Armies of 10, 100,000 people just didn't work. So they decided to split them up into legions. And that is a group of 5,000 infantry, or foot soldiers, supported by cavalry, horseback. And the army was powerful, and a key factor in Rome's rise to greatness. Please take a moment and highlight civic duty, responsibility, Roman legion, 5,000 infantry. Structure of government under the Republic. If you're noticing on the bottom, it says if you're watching this, write this down. Please ignore that. It's a lot to write, and it's a lot to expect. But let's take a moment and look at this. And at the end, I'm going to ask you a question. Notice the two consuls and the head of the government, the 300 senators, and the assembly. And who's in charge of them? How long they have? Now, as I mentioned in class, two consuls are elected only for one year, and they couldn't serve again for another 10. It goes back to separation of power. They didn't want people in power for too long. They acted as judges. And remember, with Cincinnatus, in an emergency, the councils would choose a dictator and a single ruler to make decisions. It could be anybody. That's pretty amazing. It might be even you, if you're worthy. Now, when it wasn't a time of conflict, both consuls had to agree on their decisions. Each had the power to veto the other. In Latin, Veto means, I forbid. The Senate was made up of 300 members, and they had a lifetime term. They directed spending and tax dollars. They approve and disapprove laws made by the assembly, or the lower class, the plebeians. And they made decisions concerning relationships with foreign powers. However, they let the assembly declare war and peace. I want you to write down quickly, do you think this form of government would work today in the United States? Could we work with two councils, not just a, two co-presidents, a Senate that was serving for life, an assembly of regular people, could we do it? Please take a moment and write this down. Make sure you, over it, highlight a smiley face. The end.